But it, this has been so good for us um, throughout this, this last almost seven months going through Ephesians. We have been slowly but surely going through and, and picking it apart and letting it speak to us. And um, it, it's just been good. And today, it's also not going to disappoint not because of the communicator, but because of what's getting communicated. And, um, and so, in all sincerity, the prayer that I prayed about our hearts being open and ready to receive, I hope that's all for you, because if your heart's not ready, then you're not going to receive anything. That's just how it works. You get out what you put in. All right, so if you are unfamiliar with the Bible, just look to somebody that looks like they have uh, been around the Bible a little bit and ask them to get you to Ephesians chapter 6. And we're going to read four verses to, to wrap this thing up, and, um, and it's just, it's going to be good for us today. So as you are thumbing your way there, or if you, we're not, we're not partial, if you have your Bible on your phone, then go ahead, that makes it a little bit easier, you can just type in Ephesians and boom, you're there. So um, once again, Father, our heart is open to you, our mind is open to you. Um, in the words of your son, he said, have ears to hear, and that's what we want to have today, is ears to hear, eyes to see in a heart to receive. And so, Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to do what we've been doing all along and read it, and then we're going to digest it and dissect it. Not in that order, but um, that's what we're going to do. Tychicus. Y'all say Tychicus. Tychicus. It's just a fun name. Anybody name their child that, by the way? (laughs) Have fun helping the teacher learn that one. Tychicus. Our dearly loved brother and faithful servant in the Lord will tell you all the news about me so that you may be informed. I am sending him to you for this reason, to let you know how we are and to encourage your hearts. Peace to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who have undying love for our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give like... I'm going to do my best to give a 30-second snapshot of of Ephesians, just to catch everybody up to speed. This is a letter to a young church who are fresh on the scene of what it's like to live out a relationship with Christ in a mixed community. You have Gentiles, you have people that have been part of um, the faith community, and they're, they're coming under the name of Jesus for the first time. And so this letter is saturated with, with verbiage about unity, about identity, about growing, perpetually growing in your relationship with Christ. And then um, how we are all different, and yet it's all necessary. It's necessary that we're all together in our different functions. That's called a healthy church body, being different, but set on the same purpose, which is to bring glory and praise and, and acknowledgement to Jesus. And, um, and then he, he, last Sunday, what our focus was, was on the, the, the full armor of God. We are in a daily war, a daily battle, and if we go out kind of naked, we're going to get beat up a little bit. But there's some spiritual armor that we wear that doesn't just allow us to make it through, but it allows us to stand in victory. And so that's a snapshot of Ephesians, and we end with this salutation where he's like, listen, um, here, here's, I'm, essentially I'm setting up this guy named Tychicus to pastor you during these days of difficulty. And then I've got some final, like, two words that I want to give you. This letter to this church in Ephesus was delivered by Tychicus. We are reading Ephesians today because of the capacity and the capability and how people could depend on Tychicus. So he may be a very uncommon person in Scripture, but he has a very profound effect on our faith today because not only the letter to Ephesians, but also the letter to Ephesus and potentially even 2 Timothy, one of those other minor ones, was also delivered by Tychicus. He is incredibly valuable to us. Only five or six times in Scripture is his name mentioned, a couple times in the book of Acts, and then a couple times in these minor prison books. And the reason why they're called prison books is because Paul wrote these letters while he was in prison. So there's a little bit of a snapshot for us. Now we have Tychicus. Tychicus. Our dearly loved 
brother. Let's just go through these, these different depictions. And before we do that, I want to allude to this picture behind me of uh, a, a kind of a drawing, if you will, of Paul and Tychicus in prison. It'll get there eventually. And, and one of the things that we need to pay attention to is the man in chains is Paul. The other one kneeling down is Tychicus. And the thing that strikes me, obviously this was not like a selfie or a photo op. This is kind of someone's projected idea of what this scenario would have looked like. Not, without question, Paul would have been older, and Tychicus would have been either 20s, maybe young 30s at the absolute most, but most certainly in his 20s. And the reason why I wanted to show this picture is because it doesn't matter how old you are or what season of life you are in, you should always be in a posture of reaching forward and reaching behind. Always, perpetually. Young people, you don't know everything. I hear a lot of parents saying, amen. amen. Um, <laughs> we, we, we just go through this phase where we think we know everything, but if you can somehow bring your heart and your mind to this selfless mode of learning and being a student your entire life, it will go so good for you. Like, like, Putting yourself in the position of like, what can I learn from somebody around me? What can I learn from this person, especially somebody who has either different colored hair than me or has less hair than me? What can I learn from them? What can I learn about who God has been to them and how God has shown himself faithful in their life? What can I learn from them? So young people and even old people, older, I will go with older because nobody likes to be called old, older people. Always find yourself in that posture of learning. None of us arrive until we've arrived at the face of God, full, like without hindrance at all. Until that day, we are all still students. The other side of that is as we are students, we also need to be reaching behind us to the next generations. For the older generations, if you've stopped pouring out into the next generations, I just want to give like a gentle shame on you because that should never stop. You are never outdated. You are never obsolete. Your voice is never too quiet. The only reason that your voice would be too quiet is because you've stopped speaking. Now, you need to be wise as to when you speak. How many people know that some people can just talk and not say anything? That's my biggest fear, by the way. Um, I could say a lot of words, but what are you saying? Reaching in front and reaching behind is so important. And Paul got this. Paul understood this. And so here he has this young, young man who he gives some attributes to, Tychicus, our dearly loved brother, He's a familiar name to these churches because he has been with Paul for a number of years on this, this journey when Paul was on this mission of starting churches. Tychicus, the unknown or, or known but not the front runner, supporter of, of the ministry that God was doing through Paul. But he was known enough for Paul to say, our dearly loved brother. Now, one of my... One of my um, curiosities as life continues on is I'm really curious what our language is going to be like in 50 years. Because I'm sure for some of you that are older, you've seen a digression of, of grammar. <laughs> for rizzle, or I mean, that's even old, right? Like, for rizzle? <laughs> what is that? Um, like, there's just verbiage. Like, we don't even use full sentences anymore. BRB, right? We just throw out shorthand stuff, LOL, and that's how we talk, and what's LOL? I thought it was lots of love, and no, it means laugh out loud, and that's why, anyways. Um, <laughs> have y'all ever seen those text messages where the parents think that they're saying one thing, but it's like in a completely inappropriate setting, like so-and-so just passed away, LOL. <laughs> no, they just, they just, they just died. I know, LOL. <laughs> what do you think you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> so, 
so we have this digression of our verbiage, and so the reason why I say that is because we don't use the word dear very often, unless we're drafting a note to somebody, dear so-and-so, and even that doesn't happen a lot, a lot these days. I love Summer with all my heart. Summer's my wife, and so I love her with all my heart, but I don't wake up every morning and be like, oh, dear, <laughs> my dearly beloved wife. I don't say anything because more than likely I have dragon breath. And so, um, <laughs> but there's this digression of verbiage. But as I was reading this, when Paul says, our dearly loved brother, it, it triggered something in me to go down this road of thinking of like, who are the dearly loved ones in my life? Not, not just like, you know, family's easy, like, oh, I really love family, but even that's a stretch for dearly loved ones, right? Um, maybe, depending on your family. And so I started thinking about that, though. Who are the dearly loved ones? And it, it helps to get a premise or like a foundation of what, what's being said here. This whole dearly loved brother is built on the, 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 the common ground of Christ, that's where it has started. This, the only reason Paul's able to say dearly loved brother is because their relationship was founded on the premise of the truth of who Christ is. And then they've, they've had some, some tests and trials along the way. Their, their relationship has stood the test of time. They've, it stood the test of life. And the outcome of that test, now that they've remained true to one another, is the, the ability and the right to say dearly loved brother. I wonder who in, in, in your life, I wonder who you might be a dearly brother or sister to. If nobody, then that, you might want to have a flag going off in your mind of like, maybe I've not been proven to anybody. Maybe my, my, the, the way I'm faithful in a relationship to my friends or to a girlfriend, fiance, wife, maybe I've not been that. And so it should call the question, is it, even, is it even right to say that I am someone's dearly loved brother or sister in Christ? It makes you think about how, how we're living our life and, and the depth of our relationships. Isn't it fascinating? And, and I feel like this is old news. Like we've been hearing this over and over and over again of how, how much is at our disposal to stay connected with people and yet we live in the most lonely generation in, in the most lonely day ever. It's fascinating. We have the capacity to remain perpetually connected through technology, and yet people, I think the, the, the antidepressants are like soaring because people are depressed and lonely. See, well, I don't know that we get this concept of dearly loved brother. It's foreign to us because we struggle in our own minds of what relationship really looks like. Dearly loved brother. Dearly loved means favorite. So essentially, Paul's saying, you guys know him. He is our profoundly adored sibling. And the reason why I say that too is, yes, it's built on Christ, but also our life is set on the same purpose. Our life is about the name of Jesus. Our work is about his work. There's no room for ego here. It's, it's all Jesus. It's all His work and bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. That's what we're about. That's what our minds and our hearts are set on. And so He and I, all of it, all y'all know that that's what Tychicus is all about. Therefore, He is our dearly loved brother. Do we got that? Okay. We might get it intellectually, but I wonder if we'll struggle with it practically. Tychicus our dearly loved brother and faithful servant in the Lord. Faithful servant in the Lord. This is an interesting one. We'll get to the word faithful. We, kinda, we, we would know what that means. It means to just always be there, to be faithful. But servant, I think it's so interesting that Paul uses this verbiage because in the original language, he's saying one who is easily persuaded. Doesn't that sound negative? Like, some parents, you, you, while you're raising your children, you want them to hang out with such and such people, and you're like, well, I, I, I'm just concerned for you because you're, th those individuals easily persuade you to be somebody that you're not. 
right? Anybody have those conversations? Maybe you aren't there yet as a parent, but maybe you remember being raised that way of like, I don't want you hanging out with them because they are bad influences. You are easily being persuaded to live in a way that is not you and, and not the way we raised you. So it could have a negative bend to it, but here, the reason why it's positive is because it's the full sentence. And faithful servant in the Lord. What Paul is saying about Tychicus is that you, you are easily persuaded in the truth of who Christ is. Like you are hook, line, and sinker. You, you bought in. You, you get it. You're going to live for it. And that's it. That's, it's done. Done deal. You have been convinced there is no talking you out of it. And that truth and the way that you live for that truth, nobody is going to convince you to live any other way than for Christ. I wonder if that would characterize our, our life. Faithful servant. Could that be said of us in our relationship with Christ that we are faithful servants? Because the antithesis of that would be unfaithful servant. And I don't even, so, so I guess it still works, so you either have a faithful servant or an unfaithful servant, and an unfaithful servant, are they truly a servant? Because unfaithfulness means that you've broken relationship to go do your own thing. And we can break that down and how that fits in different areas of life of where, where how unfaithfulness can be played out in people's lives, but nonetheless, the short and skinny of it is, I know that I'm tied to this individual or to this purpose, but I want to divorce myself from it and do my own thing. See, here's why that is detrimental in this whole conversation about a relationship with Christ or, or pursuing God, trying to live the life that God has called us to live. This is why it's detrimental. When people are unfaithful to Jesus, they have no capacity to comfort others, period. You can't go there because your heart's not there. Now, here's, here's how this plays out. When I want to do things that I want to do that are contrary to what God's heart is for me and purpose for me, Paul says this earlier in Ephesians that he's saying that you guys are growing a calloused heart. Anybody know what a callous is? It's like an overuse of, of a certain area, right? And so what it does to, to build up a tolerance is it, it builds layers of skin, right? And, and that skin becomes hardened. Now, my grandpa Bowers, who passed away last year, he, he worked in a steel mill, and his hands were knobby, and, and like just, they were just like, they were just really interesting looking hands. They were just knobby and bumpy and just gruff looking hands. And, and they were they had a lot of trauma done to them through the years because of what he did. And he would be able to grab things that nobody else would grab because of the layers of toughness in his skin. And you're like, oh my gosh, doesn't that hurt? Like, how does that not bother you? And in the same way, literally what I just said is, if we aren't if we don't remain faithful to Christ, what's going to happen is life is going to happen and what people will say is, why doesn't this bother you? Man, and this, this is why this is so important. It hit me this past week when the news came out about the, there's another shooting out west, I believe it was in California, and I think nine or, nine or more were killed. For the first time of hearing that kind of a report, I wasn't stunned by it. It was almost expectant. And I, I got bothered that I wasn't bothered anymore. See, it's that over, it's that repetition of things where we just become accustomed. It's, it's, it's built up so many layers that we're desensitized to the trauma of things that happen. And it's just crazy. If it's, and so it's even more so that way if we have no relationship with Christ. You can't feel compassion for others if you aren't connected to Christ. It's impossible. Faithful servant. 
Disconnectedness is debilitating. So I wrote these notes. If you're not attached to love, you can't love. If you're not attached to grace, you won't be gracious. If you're not attached to peace, your narrative is going to be anxiety. You see, it, it's not rocket science, yet we find ourselves in these difficult situations only because we're not connected to Christ. And I feel like I, I, I get on this broken record about the, a tool that's accessible to us as a church and really anybody that wants to access the website, it's, it, it's, uh, there's a tab that says Grow Deeper, and then there's a, a, a reading plan that you can access. And the reason why we have a daily reading plan is because that's your daily being tethered to Christ. If you're not in the Word, and, and I know, I've, I've, heard, I've heard preachers, this is such a strange place to be in, like a kid growing up listening to preachers, be like, okay, bro, whatever. And so here I am, and I'm like, I feel like I'm saying things where people are like, okay, whatever. But some feel like it's, it's some people get stressed at the, the charge of being in the Word daily. But you, you got to be in the Word daily. You got to open the Bible. You got to get the app open on your phone and just feed your heart and your mind with the Word of God. It is your life. You will find yourself numb and desensitized not only to the world, but to people closest to you because you're not tied to Christ. I feel like I'm on a broken record stretch here, but you get the point. Faithful servant in the Lord. He's going to tell you all the news about me. Paul's not being narcissistic. Paul is genuinely, he knows that this community really cares about him. He helps start this community. They have affection for him. They're like, what is going on with Paul? Tychicus is the man that's delivering the letter and the news about how Paul's going and how he's doing. He says, I'm sending him to you. In verse 22, I'm sending him to you for this very reason, to let you know how we are and to encourage you. So Tychicus is not only a dearly loved brother, a faithful servant, but he is also a messenger, an encourager, and a comforter. Tychicus is a pastor who is able to not only deliver practical news to a young body of believers, but also help unpack the meaning of the words that they're just listening to. Let me just play this out for a second, because it's not just like Tychicus was like, hey, here's, here's a letter, Paul's in prison. Peace out. I imagine it went something more like this, where I don't know if he read it, or if there was an elder in this young body of believers that was like, oh man, thank you so much, we've been waiting for any kind of correspondence with Paul, thank you so much. And so, here, here's the letter. Oh, you, you want me to read it? I'll read it. It's all about everything is in Christ. And what, what he was, I was, all of this, by the way, I was sitting right next to Paul. It was pretty trippy, like all these different things that the Holy Spirit was speaking to him. And, and like I, I helped him pin these things. And, and so he, he saw that it was fitting to start with the, the fact that everything, everything is in Christ. Your relationship with him. Um, even before that, this world is created to give glory to God. Everything that, that is was made through him and to him and for him. And the God that created all of that, he, this is crazy, but he wants you. He, he saved you. He, he did this work for you. He sent his son for you. And so that you are a new creation in Christ. And so Jesus bookends this letter like from the beginning to the end it's all about Jesus and so now with this new identity not only do you have a new identity but all of you have this new identity in Christ and you are uniquely made and you're all different can I get an amen you're all different and so what you need to do is bring your differences together because that is not only a representation but the actual um, revelation of the body of Christ. And when I mean the body of Christ, I literally mean the physical body of Christ. You as the church, when you act and live and move in the gifting that he's given you. And by the way, a gift, listen how crazy this is. Think about this. A gift is a movement 
of God's grace in you. And so any good that comes out of you, any giftedness that comes out of you is nothing of yourself. It's solely a movement of God's grace. And that is to be used to build up the church. And I was sitting there for this one. Um, It goes like this. But now speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into Christ. So as many ways as you can draft on a piece of paper, that's how many ways we are to grow. Grow in every way into Him. And then right at the end of the letter, there's like this massive flood of soldiers just going everywhere, this way and that. And, and Paul got excited and he started to write down the parallel between the armor that the soldiers were wearing and the armor that we wear as Christians, so that this battle that we are a part of every single day, not only do we just make it out of, the, out of it, but we stand in victory. Man, it was, it was awesome writing this letter for y'all. And I'm here for the next little bit just to help unpack this, but, but church, you, you got this. The health of this church doesn't rest on the letter that Paul sent you. The, the, the future of this church rests upon your faith in Christ. So you, Paul, here, here's the news. I just got word right when I was getting ready to leave that in a real short time, Paul's going to be executed. And he, he sent me to, to encourage you and to comfort you. And so I'm just going to be here with you for a little bit. But you got this. Like, I think that was the tone and the vibe of Tychicus where he's just showing up and loving on some people that are new to the faith. And they're like, is this really what it's all supposed to be? Is this, is this what this life with Jesus is? And he came to encourage them. So what Paul did in this section is he set up Tychicus to pastor this community. Y'all know him. He's like our favorite sibling. He's like the brother you never had, right? You know, you know Tychicus. He's coming for you. And he's going to hang out with you for a while. So there's the little setup about Tychicus. Then we have Paul's final words. Peace. We're going to make it 21st century, okay? So nobody's offended. Peace to the brothers and sisters. (laughs) Peace to the brothers and sisters. And love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Peace to the brothers in love with faith. I, I got kind of, you know, kind of confident in my, my, my Bible skills. I thought peace was going to be a given name, shalom. I was like, peace, it's shalom. But it's not that word. It's a different peace that Paul speaks over this body of believers. This peace, I want to read this a couple times just so it sinks deep, because this is what Paul would want to say to us today. Um, Peace to the brothers and the sisters. And by the way, both of these, both the peace and the love are from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to start with peace. Peace, this is the tranquil state of the soul that is assured of salvation through Christ. The tranquil state of the soul assured of its salvation through Christ. You see, this kind of peace can make it through anything. This, this state of the soul. Once my mind understands the state of my soul, there's nothing that I can't make it through. There's nothing that this being can't endure. And that is paramount in our life because there's a lot of crummy stuff that happens all the time. And to say crummy is like uber PG, right? Like some of y'all that have lived some life and you've got some crazy bumps and bruises and some chunks missing out of you because of the stuff that you've gone through in life, if it weren't for the state of your soul, you would have gone nuts. You would have lost it. You would have either lost yourself or you would have lost it on somebody. I don't know how people go throughout life without without the peace that comes through knowing who Christ is. I don't understand. And it's not this just apply when necessary. This is a perpetual understanding 
to walk in this. It's, it's a state of the soul, meaning it's got to be irreversible. This is my condition. I've got a condition. It's called hope in Christ. And it's stuck with me forever. Peace to the brothers. So even in saying that, peace to. It means like, so let's just say this. I'm going to throw the ball to somebody. So before I throw it, do they have it? It's not a trick question. <laughs> Peace to you. Why would he need to say that? Because in the reality of the, 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 with the reality that, that Paul's in prison and his death is inevitable and, and the heat is going to get turned up on the early church like crazy, Paul saw it fitting to say, like, as if his words could be a flood of, 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 of confidence and strength. He says, peace, peace to you. Get it in your head and your heart, the state of your soul. How is this practical? Um, let's just throw out some known ones. Cancer reports. I don't know how people do this without Christ. I, I legit don't. I don't know how families brave that path without hope in Christ. Work is difficult. You got difficult people that you work with. Culture says, go at it with them. And the Bible says to go there too, but it's all in the demeanor. If you're going there just to rip their head off, but not go for peace, then just be quiet. Let me give you a practical one that's a real life one. Two and a half weeks ago, while my mom was here helping us move, she gets a phone call that the church that she's a part of, that I spent my senior year in, that their children's pastor was early one morning, that morning, it was Tuesday morning, um, responding to a phone call that she got that her dad had a heart attack. So she, it's early in the morning, and she's responding to that call, heading to the hospital. And this is rural Indiana. My hometown is a town of 5,000 people. And as she's on her way to the hospital, it's early in the morning, it's dark, and she sees flashing lights, and she, she thinks it's farm equipment. Makes sense, farm country. As she got right up on it, it wasn't a, a piece of farm equipment, it was a school bus. And with her truck, she drove through four children, killed three, and the fourth one won't walk for the rest of their life. This girl is 24 years old, and she had her children with her in the truck. The pastor that she works for is a first responder. He shows up on the scene to try to assess what's going on, and it took him a little bit of time to catch up on the fact that this was his children's pastor. His father-in-law, the next day, passes away. Their church immediately starts receiving death threats. How do you navigate life unless there's peace to you? The state of my soul, no matter the situations in life. I wish that was made up, but that is real. Lives on all fronts changed forever. Without question, in that moment, in that morning, anger and bitterness has been birthed in a lot of hearts. Anger and bitterness towards the church, towards God, the, the list is endless. And so what do you, what do, you do with that? You, you walk in the confidence of who you are in Christ and you walk in peace. Peace be 
peace to the brothers and sisters, and love with faith. What he's saying there is benevolence with a conviction of God's existence. There's, a whole, there's all different types of benevolence, but true, a true benevolent heart is only one that is rooted in the conviction of God's existence. Because see, any other kind of generosity has selfish intentions. And so it's not true benevolence. It's actually called manipulation. How gross is that? Where there's a lot of perceived niceness, but because it has nothing to do with the knowledge or the conviction of the truth of God, what's wrapped up in it in a really disgusting kind of way is manipulation. I'm doing this to look nice so that I win your approval so that I can get an angle on what I really want to be a part of. I mean, it's gross. And so if you are benevolent, if anybody's benevolent without the conviction of the truth of who God is and His existence, then just don't be nice. Save it until you, I'm not saying be a jerk, I'm just saying don't, don't do stuff if it's saturated in, in filth and self-serving. Faith with love. Generosity and, and benevolence with the conviction of God's existence. And this is probably the most difficult portion that, that we're going to land on, where he says, grace be with all. I mean, this last sentence, it kind of starts like, man, this is good. He's, he's, he started with grace and peace and all this kind of stuff, and now he's going to end. He's bookending it with Jesus and grace, and, and this is good. And we're going to be encouraged for like a hot second, and then it's going to be like, oh, okay, this means something here. Grace be with all. Feeling the warm fuzzies, Paul. Grace be with all who have undying love for our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk a tightrope here, okay? Not literally because, okay, you get my point. How do we unpack this? To... To walk in grace, we need to to have within us an undying love for Christ. So if I do my simple unpacking of this, let's say that my love for Him is dying. Because that would be the difference. You have an undying faith and then you have a dying. An undying love and a dying love. Can you still be covered by God's grace if your faith or if your, if your, um, your, your love for Him is dying? Right? So let's just play on that a little bit. If I constantly go out of my way to defy and slap God in the face and defame His name and, and do all that I can do to prove his, that he does not exist, should that individual expect to live under the covering of his grace? I appreciate the non-answers on that one because it's, it's pretty murky. Because here, here's my challenge with it. There's another verse that says, however far sin runs, God's grace runs farther. Thank you, Jesus, Love that. I will stand on that one. I'm not going to test the limits on it. I'm not going to abuse it, like see how much sin I can create so I can see how far His grace goes. I'm not going to go be a bonehead just so I can prove God's grace. But if I perpetually live in a way that tests His grace to the point where I'm defying Him and speaking against Him, I should not expect my life to be full of grace. I mean, there's a lot of scriptures throughout the Old Testament that, like, that there are different things that, that would happen in people's lives, and it was God just heaping coals on them of like, see, life's just fill in the blank. I mean, life's life. Life's just keep filling in the blank of all the negativity and all that kind of stuff and just get set on that path. And the only way that you can come back to that covering of grace is through faith in Christ. But man, I don't... see. I would not say that I'm a, I'm a veteran in ministry. We've, someone I've been a part of in, in ministry for like 17 years. 
So we've seen some things. We've seen a lot of things, but we've not seen all things. But I have seen some people say yes to Jesus only for a few years to go by and their hearts are crazy hardened to the truth of who He is. And they are actually um, doing all that they can to convince others that God doesn't exist. I'm telling you all that that individual cannot expect for there to be an outpouring of God's grace in their life. So let me go to the positive then. What this does to me in my heart is it, it just begs the question on an ongoing basis. Is my love for Him undying? You see, I, th- I think He's even less frustrated with a defiant heart than a casual heart. Have you ever just met somebody that is passionless and lifeless, unable to make commitment, unable to be moved by anything? I think that's more frustrating to God. Both are hurtful, but you remember when Jesus did that whole parable about God, he he wishes that you were hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, you're like disgusting to his mouth. And so, here's what's sneaky about this. Well, I'm not like going all evolution and, um, you know, starting those kind of seminars, trying to talk people out of God's existence, but I'm also not crazy pursuing Christ, so I'm just kind of going to church because it's what my family does, but I don't really know Jesus. I'm just, I'm just here. Now, if you're here because you're curious and you're interested and you're, you're on the hunt for the truth of who Christ is, keep running. But if you're just here to take up space, stop coming. Because you're not impressing anybody. It's just not. A passionless, um, hungerless heart doesn't, doesn't really get God's, you know, spot. Oh man, they took up space. Yes! Love it. Look at that butt print in the chair. That's just like awesome. I mean, I can't see their heart at all, but their body's there. Y'all, I'm, I'm a jacked up person. I'm messed up. I'm, I'm, I'm just a messed up person. So, because I know my messed upness, it causes me to really hunger and thirst for Jesus because I need His grace. And I love the mess out of Him. I mess up a lot, but I love the mess out of Him. And, and my heart might wander, but I know in the heart of hearts that I'm still tethered to Him. And that rope is only going to let me go so far, and then it's going to yank me back to where I need to be. And I'm going to come back to a place always if I'm not knelt down, I'm knelt down in my heart, and I'm like, Father, um, I'm, I'm a bonehead. You know me. You know who you're working with. You know what you created. I mean, you, we can't say you did this, but... <laughs> all who have undying love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And then if my, if, if Paul had a mic to drop, grace to all who have undying love for Jesus Christ. Go be the church. Love the mess out of Jesus and love the mess out of people. That's our, that's our endeavor. So at our church, I didn't say this at the beginnings. For anybody that's new, we, we, um, we encourage 
y'all to grab the connection card because on the flip side of it, there's a place to, to respond. It is proven by a study done by Harvard that when you write stuff down, you, you remember it longer. So we do this not because Harvard says it, but because we know that it's important to respond to something that you just heard. So I want to encourage you to grab the connection card. And here, here's the... Here's the way we're, we're going to respond today. What words would you use as adjectives that describe your love for Christ? W- would you borrow Paul's word and define your love for him as undying? Or would that cause you to be like, I, I can't even put that? How would you define and describe? What words would you use? to wrap around your love for Christ.